Hello, I'm Andrew Daly, and I'm delighted to be joined today by Cathy McCranny, who until recently was the head of marketing at Leverdata. Prior to that, she was at Globality in a similar role, so she brings an enormous amount of experience in AI and its applications in the world of procurement tech uh, to uh, our conversation today. And that builds on 18 years at Cisco, where Cathy was also involved in some major transformations, a couple of notable acquisitions, which have given her a perspective which not many marketing people really have, because she's really got that connection between uh, the marketing world and also the business world, and, and has used that in her, her career to really help their customers. Cathy, welcome. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you. It's great to be here, Andrew. Cathy, I want to start by asking you about some of the common hurdles that you see companies face when they are adopting AI, particularly where that really impacts them in their operations and their growth strategies. Absolutely. So there are really four common hurdles that I've seen from my experience around AI adoption. The first one, big one, is the lack of data quality and visibility. Companies really struggle with this because they're using a lot of archaic tools, spreadsheets and emails, and they also don't have visibility to other functions across the company. So getting access to the high quality data that they need is really critical to be able to successfully implement AI. And in fact, Deloitte recently did a survey that showed that 35% of executives cite poor data quality as a major factor and a barrier in adopting AI. So I would say that's a big one. And there's also a huge talent gap and finding professionals who are comfortable, adept at working with AI, developing AI, even just using AI solutions is a big challenge for organizations right now. I'd say the third one is around cultural resistance. And there is a big resistance to change naturally within organizations and especially when it comes to adopting AI. And PwC even said that 56% of it in the survey they just did said that cultural challenges were the biggest barrier to AI adoption. And I'll talk more about that as we, we um, continue, but that is another area that I've seen is very difficult for companies to overcome. And then finally, I'd say the regulatory and ethical concerns that keep surfacing and are becoming more and more important. Companies are following and trying to comply with regulations that keep changing. And there's obviously ethical considerations as well regarding AI utilization. So all of these are also presenting more hurdles for businesses. And since you mentioned that talent gap, of course, that's my, my area as a recruiter. And I gave a presentation recently to a group of procurement leaders in the States that I was on, the, on a procurement innovation day. And I was particularly asked to talk about the talent gap and what people are going to do about that, not just now, but for the second half of this decade with their workforce planning and how they can win the battle for talent, not just for experienced talent that perhaps is already in the marketplace, but also that, that next generation of graduates, if you will, who are coming out of great schools with knowledge of AI and how that can be a, a foundation for automation strategy. So I really do think this is on the agenda for you know, procurement leaders, in, in, usually in the elite functions that are ahead of, of the curve in terms of adoption of tech, but we've definitely got a challenge in that area. I certainly agree with that. I'm not as well versed in the other areas, of course, that's very much your specialist subject, but I'd certainly agree with the time gap. And Cathy, we've spoken in the past about your passion for sports. I know you're a big lover of snowboarding uh, mm -hmm. and surfing. How would you compare the challenges of an adventure sport like that with the parallels you'd see in overcoming obstacles in adoption in business? There must be some connections you see yourself. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of a lot of bumps along the way, and and I think you know being comfortable with continuing to learn, having a mindset where you're okay and and actually um, willing to take obstacles and new new challenges new things on is key and you know change is hard and it's easy to stick with things that are safe that you're comfortable with and not push yourself but the things that are hard are going to be things that give you the biggest rewards long term so i think that's been a big learning for me I think risk management, you know, just like surfing, snowboarding, any adventure sport, AI involves really taking a look at the risks and rewards and 
and taking calculated actions to mitigate the risks as well. Whether it's like a steep slope you're dropping into or deploying AI, you just won't get the benefits if you don't take the risk. And then finally, I would say persistence. And I, I could say firsthand how many injuries and <laughs> things I had just on both surfing and snowboarding, but snowboarding in particular, you know, I think success requires that, again, you stick with it and you have resilience, even if, you know, you hit those bumps in the road, you just get right back up and you keep going. And then it becomes, again, the benefits just continue to snowball after that. Indeed. And you mentioned earlier on in that answer there about continuous learning. And I think that's something which, again, I, I touched on in my presentation about people fostering that sort of mindset, that sort of culture in their organizations that now in this era of tech, you know, tech moves at such a pace, we have to have that mindset of continuous learning and adaptability if we're going to truly embrace the opportunities. Then if you're somebody who wants to get better at your job, enabled by tech rather than being somebody who's fearful of AI replacing you, for example, then that mindset is absolutely critical. As indeed, and again to your other point about um, you know, sort of risk management and fear of failure. I think we both met I mean, originally at a DPW event a couple of years ago in Amsterdam, and there was a couple of presentations in particular last year that I really enjoyed, actually from people from the States again. And, and they really talked about how creating an environment where people didn't fear failure, you know, experimentation, curiosity, not being fearful of, of getting a negative outcome, actually embracing the fact that you might learn more from um from failing than you perhaps might do from succeeding although obviously there's a bit of context there on a snowboard you know you don't want to take that too far with a rich margin obviously so yeah i think there's some really good points to there and really good parallels and we can apply in our personal lives to our business lives so why kathy here's a question for you why what are the key reasons why there's a difficulty for companies uh when they're integrating ai into their workflows and how can leaders really navigate those complexities effectively? Because that's something which I hear a lot about. So starting with why it's so difficult, I think three things. One, it's highly complex. Implementation is complex. Integrating AI into existing workflows and or even disrupting the workflow is, is time consuming and it requires resources and expertise. And so it takes time for companies to successfully find the right solutions and adopt them. And so, for example, the Boston Consulting Group said 70% of AI projects fail because of how complex they are. It, so it just underscores that, that, you know, it's not an easy thing. And that's why having the tenacity and the willingness to take on a new challenge is important. That being said, the returns, once you get over that initial hurdle and you invest the time, can be significant and, and way exceed the amount of time up front in adopting it. Um, there's also the alignment with the business. And I think one of the things that can be difficult with AI integration is ensuring the initiatives align with the business broader business objectives. Really important, really critical. You, don't want to just adopt a solution to adopt a solution. It needs to have and provide tangible value that furthers the business's overall objectives. And then lastly, change management. Again, you know, I know I brought it up, but it, and you've brought it up, it really is important in terms of why companies have so many challenges with the integration. Um, effectively managing organizational change and overcoming resistance to AI among employees is the number one thing that's critical, obviously, for success. It can't be something where the leader comes in and says, we will adopt this, and then you expect that the employees will, will do it. In terms of, you know, why, what's important in terms of, of really driving adoption, I think there's really three things, you know, getting leaders, leadership buy-in per the point I just made. I think the most critical factor in adoption is that org leaders must champion AI initiatives and really show their commitment to innovation, uh, providing the resources and support for the adoption. 
Um, there's obviously education and training that's really key and important um, to help alleviate fears and build confidence in how people can really adopt and use AI, what are the benefits of AI, and then a culture that also really thrives and even incentivizes employees around experimenting and trying new things is also really key. Yeah, there's a couple of great points in there, Kathy, actually. And the education training, you know, again, uh, a bit of a, a sort of uh, hot topic for me with the conversations I have. And I think there's a real gap between the elite that are, are experimenting and embracing and, 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 and using technologies, not just AI driven, but, you know, certainly that's in the equation. But the elite do that so much better than the pack, in my opinion. That's what separates them and that's what enables them to attract and retain, retain great people because people can see the progression, they can see the opportunity. Um, and they feel that their careers are being nurtured and they've got opportunity, as opposed to organisations that are looking envious and saying, well, those people are doing some great things with tech. You know, why aren't we doing that? Well, we can't get the business case or culturally there's some barriers to the adoption, which you touched on in, your, in your, uh, the bit you spoke about, uh, about change management there. So I think that's a really, really good point that you raised there. Do you think the principles of change management have changed that much? Because you've got, you know, obviously, you were involved at Cisco when it wasn't AI, and obviously, in transformations. You know, I saw a couple of people speak on this subject last year. It's, it strikes me that the, the fundamental principles of change management are, remain, yet we just need to adapt them for this modern era. Would you agree with that, or do you think things have really shifted? I would agree the key principles are absolutely the same. I, I spent 18 years at Cisco working across pretty much every major function of the company. And seven of those years were in the value chain management, supply chain management organization, where we underwent three major large scale transformations. And first thing I saw were these exact same principles that I also see critical to the adoption of AI by companies. And it's interesting because you know, organizations, companies are looking for ideas. They're looking for success stories of companies that have successfully adopted and utilized AI solutions. And more and more in the procurement and supply chain world, you're also seeing people move to having a best of breed portfolio where they'll have a number of different solutions that they'll identify that really meet the unique needs that they have and then they're looking for a way to seamlessly bring them together so that they truly have a best in class solution. Yeah, it's interesting. I've seen that shift as well in that market. And again, it goes back to your earlier point about why are you investing in technology, adopting for adoption's sake? You know, two key themes that I've seen, again, spoken about a lot at events. And one is you're looking to identify and solve a specific business problem. Mm -hmm. And you look at the technology that does that for you. And AI, of course, just really raise the bar for what can be achieved. Another one in procurement, of course, is actually to create an opportunity. It's not just solving a problem, it's to create an opportunity to realize some additional value, which that's how exciting this space has got now that actually there's things out there that you didn't know you might need, you didn't know you could achieve great things with. But when you look at it, you think, wow, just think what we could do if we adopted that. So I think you know some really good points there. So going back to your passion for adventure sports and, and how you sort of embrace risk-taking and calculated decision-making uh, in your activities, how does that sort of draw a parallel with risk management uh, and decision-making processes when, when companies are implementing AI tools, then, do you think? With balancing you know, the, the balance of risk and reward, I would say just like adventure sports, you know, businesses have to weigh the risks and the rewards of adoption. And as I mentioned earlier, it's, I believe, around making calculated decisions about driving innovation and, and really trying new things, things that, again, may at first seem difficult, but will, will deliver huge returns. And also looking at ways to minimize the negative impacts while you're driving that innovation. So it's that, that balance that I think a lot of companies need to figure out. I I think the other thing, you know, just like as you look at how you refine your technique in sports, how you continue to work on how how you pop up on your board and and drop into waves, or how you drop 
you know, into a slope on a snowboard. Companies need to really take an iter iterative approach to AI implementation and be willing to fail, learn from those failures and adjust, adjust the strategies accordingly. Yeah, indeed. And that's obviously a cultural thing in a lot of organizations. But, you know, one of the questions I get asked at events, and I expect to actually speak on this myself later on this year, is, that, is about this whole fear of job loss because of AI or certainly job change. And so for leaders, the challenge there, isn't there, to address the fears and the uncertainties for their teams about AI adoption. And rather than having people be fearful and, and, and not bought in, they're going to try and drive that culture of innovation and openness to technological transformation. What, what's the big challenge for leaders there to try and achieve that desirable environment for their teams, you think? I would say that for leaders, a couple of things. Um, the buy-in, as I mentioned, is having a leader who is really willing to advocate and be the biggest proponent of the benefits of AI is really important. Microsoft CEO, Satya Nadella is a perfect example, how he's always talking about the importance of AI and how it fuels innovation across industries. He does it internally, he does it externally. I mean, to me, leaders like that, whether, you know, regardless of the size of the company, but having that vision, having that support and, and belief in the potential is, is huge education and training i mentioned before but i think as solutions become more intuitive it's making it easier for employees to gain the benefits of ai without having to be ai experts that being said people need to be comfortable with AI. they need to be at least knowledgeable enough about its benefits and also being comfortable not being fearful of it affecting their jobs to the point you made. Um, there's actually research that shows that while jobs will be replaced by AI, more jobs will be created by, by AI than replaced. So it's an interesting trade-off, right? The jobs are going to shift, the, the skills that are needed are going to shift, but the jobs, the net jobs are actually projected to increase. It'll just be a different job. So people that stay ahead of it, that keep up their skills, that have training are going to be be fine. It's the people that sit back and wait and don't jump in, lean in, that I are going to struggle more. I have a son in college and he is, his favorite class right now is about AI and machine learning because the, the curriculum is very focused on that. Right now, they're obviously preparing students for the skills that they know are going to be are are critical actually for the workforce. Um, and then I've talked about experimentation, but I think you know really encouraging that and making it safe for people to take risks, as I mentioned, is 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 really important. And you know, an example I've heard is like Google has this twenty percent time policy. Um, I don't know if you've, you've heard of this as well, but they allow employees to dedicate a portion of their time, 20% of their time to what they call passion projects. So they actually are making it safe and, and carving out time in their day to do this kind of work. So again, another example of where a company can create a culture, can create uh, a way for AI and, and more advanced technologies to be accepted, adopted, and thrive. Yeah, indeed. And, and again, several really interesting points. I mean, just going back to your point about job creation versus job loss. I mean, again, um, you know, if you look at every industrial revolution we've ever had, that's always been the case. There was an example at an event I saw last year where a speaker from MIT talked about when Henry Ford created the production line, and which initially had job losses in, in Ford. But so everyone could see the jobs that were going to go, so everyone was scared. What everyone didn't know was going to create a whole new industry around the, the motel um, and, and leisure sector because people were able to travel. So we, we're sort of scared that because we can see the jobs that will be affected or replaced, but we don't know yet the jobs that will be created. In the case of AI and, and automation machine learning, obviously we've got a pretty good idea, but there will be jobs created, as there always has been, on the back of these efficiencies. So I think those that are fearful 
the best thing you can do really is to embrace it. And, and again, I'm speaking at an event next month in London, and I'm asked, and the title of my uh, presentation is Climbing the Career Ladder in an Automated World. And what I'm saying to people is don't wait for it to happen to you. Get out there and make it happen for you. So embrace digital literacy. So again, to your point about you don't have to be an AI specialist to use AI, get to a level of technical competence whereby you can actually feel comfortable using these tools and you show your curiosity and, and embrace it. And you may go from being somebody who's initially fearful to having a degree of digital literacy to then the next level of, of, of tech skills, which is technological proficiency, where you've got a deep knowledge of a particular application or a particular capability. And these are all skills that when I speak about the future of digital procurement that people need to develop. And so great companies like Google that are giving people, you know, a fifth of their week to actually, you know, work on those passion projects. Wouldn't that be a privilege to work in an environment like that where you can do that? Um, and so, you know, a lot of people want to do this but don't have the time. So to, to, that to be freed up is just a wonderful initiative, I think. I think I see it in some other organisations, not quite to that extent, but you see it in other companies where they, they're encouraging the people to invest in themselves. And yes. these are the skills they can develop because there's definitely some evidence, I've not seen any research, but anecdotally that we don't train and invest in training development in people like perhaps you might have done. I think the turning point was actually the credit crunch. I think actually budgets got tighter and that was one of the things that got put to one side. And it's never quite come back in a lot of organisations, which really is why you've got a rising thing type in terms of contract labour and that sort of thing, because people don't necessarily see as much value in being employed anymore. So there's a number of variables in that equation, which I've touched in my usual random fashion. But, you know, again, some really relevant points there about, about you know, the impact of AI on jobs uh, and skills. But, you know, my message would always be, you know, I say, don't wait for it to happen to you. Get out there and make it happen for yourself in your spare time. Or go find an environment where you are encouraged to embrace that and go and work somewhere in that sort of organisation. Yes. So, Cathy, um, fascinating insights there. Really enjoyed listening to that. Have you got anything else you'd want to add on that we've not covered on on AM? We've covered a lot there, particularly your comparisons yeah. with your, your, your adventure sports. Anything else you'd want to add to that at all? I would just reinforce three key things. One is the continuous learning mindset is is key. And I do think, you know, finding a company that that will support, you know, the innovation and the adoption of AI is is huge. But it really is, to your point, back on the individual too, to really grasp, you know, grasp this, own this and and have the passion and the interest in AI. I think in addition to the continuous learning mindset, you know, be willing to take risks, take a chance. Again, smart risks, but but take those risks. And then finally, be persistent. Don't give up. Like I said, like when I was learning snowboarding, learning surfing, there are so many times when I wanted to give up and I didn't and I've stuck with it. And now I'm finally starting to see the the results of that years later but it's it's you know been invaluable and i would never give it up anybody that wants to get in touch with more details of course everyone knows you can get me on linkedin and if you want to talk about skills talent hiring anything related to this i'd love to hear from you and of course if you want to talk about ai in business uh, anything marketing related around those subjects around software then of course kathy would love to hear from you and you can also get kathy on linkedin so thank you for watching everyone i hope you've enjoyed it I've certainly enjoyed listening to Kathy, and uh, thanks again. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs>